Well, we're back and we're going to continue on in our series in Colossians. Uh, we'll pick up in verse 13 in a second. Uh, we've had a good time in these first two teachings through uh, this uh, little New Testament letter. But I want to begin uh, with this question. Have you ever been slandered or misrepresented? Who hasn't, right? I mean, and some of the slanders I know in my life that people have said about me is like, really? Where, where do you get this stuff at? I mean, it's not even close, but, you know, people do this all the time. Well, in this Colossians church, there are false teachers that have come in and they're misrepresenting, slandering the name of Jesus Christ. They're completely teaching the wrong Jesus in this. And Paul writes this little letter to drop some theological bombs on these false teachers to set the record straight of who Jesus Christ is. You could find a title that you could call it with the, the you could call it the real Jesus. So here we go. The first thing I'm going to tell you as we get right into it is this. Jesus is our deliverer. Now Verse 13 says, For He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Now, when He says He's delivered us, the word deliver there, because Jesus is our deliverer, it means to rescue from danger. Danger? Jesus rescued us from danger? Yeah, a danger that we could not rescue ourselves from. Well, what danger were we in? The domain of darkness. What, what, what do you mean? Well, the word domain there means force, mastery, control, influence, and authority. Now, you put it together, it's starting to make sense that we have been rescued from the danger, the power, the control, the influence, the authority of Satan, who controls the world and its thinking who controls the culture. You say, come on, Jim, isn't that a stretch? No. Go back and read the Old Testament letter of Daniel. He pulls back the curtains in a, in a section there, and he lets you see that there are certain demons, powerful demons, who have strongholds over different parts of the world. In that particular case, it's the prince of Persia, Iran. So don't tell me there are no demonic forces uh, there aren't any demonic forces controlling the culture and the thinking being pushed forth through various media outlets to try to get us to think their way instead of the Word of God's way. Don't tell me that that's not true, because I know it's true. Now, we've been transferred. You know the word? It's a great thing. It's the idea of the deportation of a population from one country to another country. You know what's fascinating about that? History records, interestingly enough, that Antiochus, he um, transferred or transported 2,000 Jews from Babylon to Colossae, where the Colossian church is. So do the Colossians understand the idea of transfer? You better believe they do. So Paul, smart writer, smart teacher, he's using things that they can understand. But let me get into this to set the record straight here. The difference between that illustration and what's happening here is conquered, defeated people were transferred. But as a follower of Christ, you're not defeated and you're not conquered. As a follower of Christ, you're a winner. You've been transferred and you're a winner because you're in Christ now. Let me give you a, a, a verse, and then let me give you one of my favorite ways to illustrate the verse. I only get to say this every so often because I don't want to wear out this 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 uh, illustration, but it, it is so good. Now, it's found in Romans chapter 9, verse uh, 37. It's a great chapter. It's one of the best chapters in Romans, actually, uh, of many great chapters. Verse 37 says this to believers. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. We overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. Let me explain it this way. I like watching uh, UFC fighting. The MMA. I like watching that stuff when, when I have a chance to. 
But when somebody wins that title fight, and they're the champion, they get their million dollar check or whatever it is now. They are the conqueror. And that guy goes home. And he meets his wife at the door. But before he gets the conquer kiss from his wife, she puts out her hand. Why? Because she wants the big check. Give me the check. He hands over the check. And I know I'm dating myself. We don't do checks anymore. But she, he hands over the check. Here's the point. He's the conqueror. He won in the ring. The wife is more than a conqueror because she never had to fight, but she gets all the rewards. That's Christianity. We're more than conquerors because He loved us and rescued us and transferred us over. We've been delivered. We're more than conquerors. Never forget that. So therefore, when you and I serve and give and fellowship and pray and share, we're expanding the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, this new kingdom that we've been transported into. I like that a lot. Now, the second thing I want to say is this. Jesus delivered us from the power of self, sin, and Satan. Now, let me read verse 14. It says this. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, Mm, 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 mm. Redemption. It means to release a prisoner by payment of a ransom. We have been rescued from Satan, from ourself, from sin, by the payment of a ransom. But make no mistake, don't get this one wrong. There was nothing paid to Satan like God said, well, i got to pay Satan to rescue these people from Sorry. Satan's a loser. He's got no power. In fact, if you want to find out what he's really all about, read Isaiah chapter 14. Look at verse 16. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to say what they say there. We're going to look at Satan and say, this is the guy that shook the kingdoms? This is the guy that scared everybody? We're going to see him for what he is like. This is him? Unintimidating. But see, Jesus didn't pay a ransom on that cross to Satan. He paid a ransom because we broke the law. And this was a demand of God. The law must be paid. Someone must pay the penalty. And Jesus paid it. He carried our sins on the cross. Wow. So we're delivered from Satan, sin, and self. They have no power over us anymore. Nothing. Nothing. When they put the blood over the doorpost and lintel in Egypt and the and the angel of death came by, they were delivered by that blood from the power of of death and that that angel of death just like you and I by the power of Jesus and his blood when they crossed the Red Sea and the Red Sea um, came down on the Egyptian troops they were now delivered from the presence of Pharaoh you and I have been delivered from the power of Satan power of sin power of our old self and one day we're going to be delivered from the presence of Satan when we get to heaven and he's bound for a thousand years can you say amen to that one because I sure can now, he says that we've been forgiven. Forgiven. You know what forgiven means? It means to send away, to cancel a debt. And don't you just love it? When you make the last payment on a car, some of you know what it feels like to make the last payment on a home. Free from debt. Free. Let me tell you. Through Jesus, our faith in Him, by the blood that He shed on the cross, all of our sins have been forgiven and washed away. All of them. Now, right, listen. You may not feel forgiven, but is forgiveness based on your feelings? Or is it based on the fact of Jesus on the cross shed His blood to forgive us? Feelings do not nullify truth. Never forget that. It doesn't matter what you feel matters what it says. And if it says we're forgiven, then we're forgiven. It's just that simple. You don't walk by your feelings. You walk by your faith and what you believe. Remember that. And always remember, just because you thought something doesn't mean it's true. This Word of God is true. Okay? So hopefully I settled that one. 
The third thing I want to say to you today is this. Jesus is the creator. That's what Paul says. I like this even more. Look at verse 15 and 16. He says this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We're going to get in that in a second. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. Let's get into this now. Jesus is the creator. It says he's the image of the invisible God. The word image means exact representation. In other words, Jesus is the exact representation of the Father in heaven. Didn't Jesus tell the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Let me just side note this real quick. This is another place where Jesus is saying he's God. <laughs> Absolutely. That's what he's saying right there. Now, <clears throat> Why is Paul pressing the point of Jesus being God? Why is he pressing it to the Colossians? You know why? Let's go back to the Gnostic false teachers again. You know what they're teaching? They were teaching that Jesus, eh, he's just another angelic type mediator from God. He just, he's, when, he's many in a chain of spirit being sent from God to communicate to the people. That's what they're saying. That's what they're teaching. Paul comes down, slams the hammer of truth on him, corrects him and says, Nope, Jesus is actually the creator of all things. He's the only God. Now, Paul wrote in verse 16, He's the firstborn of all creation. Now, there's going to be a point in your life, I think, where a couple of people are going to come to your front door, either on bikes or with briefcases or something. And they're going to say, see, Jesus was born. Really? That's that Jesus is born? Well, it says he's the firstborn. Let me tell you what that word ooh, just gets me. They just don't even know what these things mean. That has to do, when you look it up, has to do not in time, like Jesus started at some point, like, oh, he was born. It has to do with rank. This word has to do with rank. Jesus is the highest rank in the universe because He created it all. Read the rest of the verses there. He created it all. He's the highest rank. Let me give you some important truths from verse 16. First important truth is Jesus is God, the Creator. I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it in the future. If an atheist ever asks you, well, who created God? Here's your answer. Say, I don't believe in created gods. Created gods are called idols. My God is the uncreated first cause of the universe. He created it all. He wasn't created. He always was. Another truth I want to give you from this is this, Jesus created us. I like that. Because just like an artist puts something of themselves in everything that they create, we and all of creation reflect something of God. Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, yeah, we're creating the image of God, image and likeness. That's a fact. But let me show you some really cool verses on this whole idea. In, in, in uh, Romans chapter 1 um, and verse uh, 20, watch what it says. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. What does he say? What's Paul telling us? He's saying, look, all you have to do is look around and you see nature, you see the creation. It's evident, it's obvious that there's a, crea a creator that he created these things. And the more science delves into these things and, and you see the fine-tuning of the universe is fine-tuned for human life and you see the complexity of the human body and all these, you realize somebody, something had to create this thing. It just didn't happen. Hmm. Let me read another verse. Psalm chapter 19. 
on this whole idea. Psalm 19 says this, The heavens are telling of the glory of God and their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. The heavens tell of the glory of God. You look up at the, at the stars at night. They have a message. It's not just saying that the expanse of the universe and all the creations all held together. Th th there's something more than that. You know in the book of Job, when he talks about the constellations, the word constellation is the Nezroth. It's the word zodiac. Signs of the zodiac. Do you know that our signs of the zodiac have been distorted for a couple thousand years now, at least through Babylon? But if you go into the original intention of those stars up in the sky, you find that there's a message, and the message begins with the virgin and the child to come to save mankind. It's up there in the stars. Adam knew this. The early believers knew this. But it's been distorted. The heavens have a message. They declare the glory of God. Isn't that amazing? Now let me say something. Everything gains its meaning through Jesus. Everything. All things have been created through Him and for Him. Science says, oh, science answers everything. People, I shouldn't say science. Science is nothing. People say Scientists say, science answers everything. No, it doesn't. Can science tell you why you're here? Can science give you your purpose? No. All science can do is say, oh, just luck of the draw, man. There's no rhyme or reason to why we're even here. Oh, how hopeful. No. A verse I like to bring out constantly now is Revelation chapter 4. And, and let, let, let me read it to you. You can turn there. 411. See, Jimmy uses this kind of regularly now. I really, yeah, because I want to drive on one point. Revelation 411 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Yeah. Let me tell you, you and I are here because of His will. God wanted us here. He's the Creator. He created us. This is why you're here. God wanted you. That's what I always tell you with that. If your kids ever ask you why they're here, you say, because I wanted you here. See, there's, there's value, there's dignity, there's honor, there's worth in these things. Never forget that. You're here because God wanted you here. Let me give you another thought. Paul said, Jesus created all things. You know why he's pushing this so hard in Colossians? You know what the Gnostics were saying, these Gnostic teachers, Gnosticistic teachers? They were saying that all matter, all matter, all physical matter in the world was evil. Hmm. Logical conclusion, if all matter is evil, Therefore, God could not have created it. And they're incorrect in that statement. Totally incorrect. So Paul sets the record straight and says, Jesus is the creator of all things. Therefore, matter is not evil. God made all things good. The problem is we humans take good things and use them for evil. And you can apply that to anything in life. Did God create sex as a good thing in marriage? You better believe it. But outside of marriage, evil. Evil. God created marijuana plants. This is a favorite of some people. God, I just can't believe this. That means it's good if you use it for rope and different things or material. But if you use it to impair yourself, evil. Evil. Because the New Testament says be sober-minded. And we saw before in Galatians, I think last week, the word sorcery is pharmakia, the use of drugs. You do not impair yourself. So now we see it being used for, for wrong things. 
Always remember that. Always remember that. Now, Jesus made all things for good. But mankind comes along in their fallen, sinful nature. It's a fallen world, guys. And they start misusing things for evil. For evil. Never be shocked at that. You live in a fallen world. But you and I, by faith in Christ, have been transferred from that domain of darkness to the kingdom of His beloved Son. We are children of God. Walk in it. Well, I'm done for today. Hopefully this meant something to you. We'll see you next time.